Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aaron Gurell, and thank you for participating in today's 127th Justice Clearinghouse webinar, which is entitled Forensics at the Speed of Crime. This is the fifth webinar in a series of six that have been sponsored by Ultra Electronics Forensic Technology. Ultra Electronics Forensic Technology is dedicated to educating justice personnel around the world about developing effective crime gun intelligence programs. They are a leader in forensic analysis, providing innovative and effective solutions like its unique technology, the Integrated Ballistics Identification System. IBIS is designed to find the needle in the haystack by discovering matches between pairs of spent bullets and cartridge cases at speeds well beyond human capacity. Ultra Electronics helps experts obtain timely information so they can make society a safer place. Now this webinar will focus on transformational forensics. This is a concept in which there is a commitment on the part of the forensic science laboratories to collaborate with clients and stakeholders to identify needed change and create a vision to guide that change so that our communities can become safer places. With respect to gun-related crime, the chief need for the investigators is to have reliable, comprehensive, and timely intelligence. This webinar will speak about enlarging the box for forensic examination of firearms related evidence to provide investigators with relevant shooting intelligence within 24 to 72 hours after an incident. While it is understood that quality cannot be rushed, it also has to be understood that for an investigator, the best results are useless if they don't arrive in time to assist in an investigation. For this webinar, we have two presenters. Our first is Ron Nichols, who will be followed by Rick Wyant. Ron Nichols of Nichols Forensic Science Consulting has over two years of experience as a firearms and toolmark examiner at the local and federal levels and accredited laboratories. He is widely published with a number of his publications routinely referenced in published court decisions with respect to Daubert and Fry evidentiary hearings. He has testified in over 100 criminal cases and evidentiary hearings involving firearms and toolmark evidence at the state and federal levels. He is internationally recognized as one of the leading experts in communicating the scientific foundations of the firearm and toolmark discipline to both technical and lay audiences, providing training and consultation nationally and internationally, including on the behalf of the United Nations. He brings over 15 years of experience developing training curricula, modules, and workshops, and providing training in various national and international venues for new and experienced examiners and technicians. Our second presenter, Mr. Wyant, has been a forensic scientist since 1995 and is currently the supervisor for the firearm and tool mark section of the Seattle, Washington State Patrol Crime Laboratory. In 2007, a mutual agreement was reached to allow usage of the NIBIN system in our facility from local police agencies. With the dedicated NIBIN technician for the area and increased support from ATF, we have demonstrated significant progress with NIBIN in our region by maintaining rapid entry and lead notification to surrounding police agencies. Now the last thing I'd like to address with everyone is some basic housekeeping items. First, the event is being recorded and is scheduled to last about 60 minutes. Second, this is a listen-only event, but you can type in any questions you have through the GoToWebinar toolbar, and we'll address as many at the conclusion of the presentation. And finally, after today's webinar, there will be a follow-up survey, and we ask that you complete it. Your feedback helps us shape our future schedule of events. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn the presentation over to our first instructor. Ron, it's all yours. Thank you, Aaron. Um, my name is Ron Nichols, and as Aaron mentioned, I have had um, been in forensic science since 1984, and so I've been in forensic science for 33 years, have recently retired from ATF. The last 26 years have been involved in firearm and toolmark identification. And I remember attending a conference back in 2001, and there was a guest speaker who asked the question, what has changed most about you as an individual since you've worked in forensic science? And the answer that most people provided was I've become more detached. I remember the advice of one colleague who trained me in crime scene reconstruction and crime scene processing. Ron, you have to put this stuff into a box or else you'll never survive. So I'm here to talk about boxes. Boxes into which we place the stuff with which we deal for self-protection and the boxes in which we place ourselves as forensic scientists. Believe it or not, these two are actually related and I believe we can deal with one in a more appropriate way as we address the first one. Next. 
The subtitle of this talk is Justice Begins in the Streets. And it's really not a question of whether it will begin in the streets, but who is going to bring justice to the streets. If we stay in our boxes as forensic scientists, it will be the shooters and the victims who purchase guns for self-protection. If we can somehow enlarge our boxes, then maybe we can actually help bring justice to our streets in addition to the courtroom. Next. But first meet Lef. I met Lef while visiting an orphanage in Palestine. Most, if not all, of the kids in this orphanage were discreetly birthed by C-section at seven months before the unwed mother could be more obviously showing signs of pregnancy, oftentimes due to rape or incest. Lef cannot be adopted because of laws and customs. At seven years of age, he will be transferred to another orphanage and at 18, released to the streets. During this visit, I also met a reformed suicide bom bomber trainer who would prey on kids like this and then train them to be suicide bombers. Where is the justice for Lef? The best I could do for him was hold him while I was there. If I could have adopted him, I would have on the spot. I couldn't. I wouldn't be allowed. But what I can do is take that energy fueled by compassion and direct it toward things I can do and differences I can make. Next. One city, tragedy in 24 hours. Levante White Jr. is in the middle. This two-year-old was gunned down in a backseat of a car in which his uncle was killed and his uncle's pregnant girlfriend was wounded. 12-year-old Canary Gentry Bowers on the right was struck in the head by a bullet outside her elementary school the very next day. And 20 minutes later in a different part of the city, 11-year-old Takiya Holmes on the left was shot and killed as the van in which he was riding pulled into an area where an 18-year-old didn't like the fact that three rival gang members were in the streets. Next. Another city. On the left, we have four-year-old Daniel Munoz, who was killed while playing in the front yard of his aunt's home. You know why he was there? Because his mom couldn't fit him in a van as she took everybody else to Knott's Berry Farm. On the right, one-year-old Autumn Johnson was killed in a drive-by shooting as she was laying in a crib. Next. Another city. Four days after Christmas, eight-year-old Rasheed Cunningham Jr. was shot and killed while walking home from her birthday party. Next. When we take those events we've encountered and box them up for our own self-protection, we face a danger of turning, turning compassion from an intended lifestyle, which helps guide our choices to an event in which we can turn it on and off. The problem is the problem, making it easier to dismiss ways in which we can potentially make a positive impact on that very same problem. Next. But as forensic scientists, we also have other boxes that we deal with. And if we consider the entire realm of possibilities, these boxes represent the scope of possibilities to which we restrict ourselves. The actual size of the boxes is dictated primarily by control. The control we seek to implement over our own box and a perceived control we allow others to have over what we do. An example of the latter is when local prosecutor's office demands certain testing be done to avoid issues in court that could be effectively argued away. But it's more easily handled by saying, well, it was done, even though the results were negative, and we really knew they would be going into the testing, but we wanted to do it anyway. Other things that dictate the size of these boxes include fear. What do we do if a mistake is made? And tradition, resistance to change. Next. Historically speaking, when introduced, ballistic imaging technology was used on a back end of casework, providing a digital solution to an open case file that had been previously been a Polaroid file if kept at all. Only cases actually worked by the laboratory went into the system, and due to continuous backlogs, it was likely weeks after a shooting event, if not months, if at all, because some laboratories just didn't do it. Next. Historically speaking, I, I use that term loosely right now because this is a very current issue and situation for many laboratories that are actually underutilizing available ballistic technology. Homicide 1 occurs and is submitted to the laboratory. After it is processed and compared, fired cartridge cases are captured using ballistic imaging technology and they come back negative. Two weeks later, a drive-by shooting occurs in which there are no victims. 
The case is put to the bottom of the pile in this laboratory where examiners are tied up doing the latest homicide. Well, that's if the case even gets to the lab because some labs are triaging these cases right out of the laboratory altogether. If there's no blood, don't submit it. We don't have time for it. Now, four weeks after the drive-by, there's another one in which a child is killed. There are witnesses to this one, and because the child was killed, they are willing to speak. And after the case is processed and compared, it is entered into ballistic imaging technology and linked to homicide number one. Now we celebrate because we just closed two homicides. But I have a question. What if that drive-by shooting in the middle was committed by the same shooter using the same weapon? If that second shooting had been entered in a timely basis and there were witnesses, is it possible we would have one less dead child? Now we may claim that the odds of such a sequence are small, but statistics show that when we have comprehensive collection, and that's where they gather up all the evidence and put it into a ballistic imaging system, a large percentage of shootings are linked to other shootings. In Memphis, it's almost 30%. And in the city of Oakland, nearly 50% of all shootings can be linked to other shootings. Next. So how do we deal with our boxes? Well, the first is to minimize detachment. It doesn't really work anyway. Not only does it reduce our capacity to care and therefore will demotivate us to change, neuroscientists have demonstrated that these boxes actually rewire our brain and can be linked to mental and physical illnesses and disorders. There are sufficient resources, <coughs> excuse me, but I wish we can process this stuff in a healthier manner. And so we should pursue those. We cannot get away from organizational boxes. I'd like to think we can think outside of the box, but I've, I've gone away from that. And actually, all we can do is expand the box in which we operate, because we will always be within a box. Next. So how do we expand that organizational box? Well, we have to first decide to whom we are responsible. We begin with collaboration instead of ending with cooperation. We have to understand the difference between essential, important, and desirable. And we also can't make decisions on bad data. We have to have a willingness to move beyond tradition. We have to remain flexible. And it's a good idea to start small and build upon that success. And I'm going to go through these in turn. Next. Bottom line is forensic science laboratories have a public entrustment. They are responsible to the public. It's not science. In fact, we use science to serve the public interest to whom we are ultimately responsible. And what are we responsible for? We say often that we're responsible for the examination of evidence and the proper interpretation of that evidence, no matter which side it may favor, the prosecution or the defense. Well, considering our expertise, we can also help the evidence to speak for victims who can no longer speak. Next. We often qualify in court as expert witnesses, and a definition of an expert witness is one who provides specialized testimony that goes beyond the knowledge of a lay person. Similarly, we have technology that goes beyond what agencies or lay persons have. And when it has the potential that ballistic imaging technology has, which has been shown to have great potential in helping to provide timely crime gun intelligence, and we needlessly limit that potential, then we are no longer serving the public interest. We are serving the interest of another. Next. Next. There we go. Yes. Okay, collaboration versus cooperation. It's important to collaborate and not just cooperate. Collaboration, we take ownership of our role in responding to a problem. When we cooperate, we do simply what we need to do to get through the problem. When we collaborate, we become a source of a team-based solution. When we cooperate, we become part of someone else's solution. When we collaborate, we understand our role is vital and take responsibility for ourselves without concern for what others are not doing. Well, when we cooperate, what we end up presenting our role, 
and we look for failings in others to absolve ourselves of responsibility. And you can tell a cooperator because they'll always say, I told you so. When we collaborate, we respond to a crime problem, hopefully reducing it in the future. And when we cooperate, we react to crimes that have already occurred with no vision for the future. Cooperation will not get this done. Collaboration is what we need to have, and we need to have that collaboration with other stakeholders and clients. Next. Ballistic imaging technology is a tool that turns a fired cartridge case into a potential eyewitness that can point toward other shootings. It was not designed to be a perfect tool. Let me restate that. It was not designed to be a perfect tool. Rather, it was designed to facilitate in moments what may have otherwise taken an examiner months if it was attempted at all. So it's important to stop putting perfection into an imperfect tool. It does not make sense. And if we can embrace that concept, we discovered that there is very little that we had considered essential to actually be essential in this context. So let's look at some examples of things that have been considered essential or important. Next. It was one time considered essential that firearm examiners compare evidence prior to ballistic imaging so that every gun represented at the scene is entered. Actually, it was required when Niven, or, uh, when Niven was first implemented by ATF. However, so much of this effort is wasted because not every case results in a lead, not every lead is a viable lead, and not every case goes to court. So a better solution would be to have cartridge cases can be reliably triaged trained technicians for ballistic imaging entry. And then if a lead is developed, evidence can be compared at a later time. I did a little bit of study on this and some statistics. And basically, in a given week, a technician with a 90% accuracy rate can enter in approximately 60% more evidence than a firearm examiner could using uh, uh, perfect techniques. So there's a lot more evidence that can go into the system uh, when a uh, technician is doing it, even though it's not perfect. Next. Firearm examiners perform correlation reviews to determine whether or not leads are present. However, that was considered essential. It's often a low priority task and commonly set aside for the more urgent. And correlation reviews get backlogged, decreasing timeliness if comprehensive collection is being pursued. So a better solution actually is train technicians to do it. And only bringing in the firearm examiners to evaluate potential leads. I was responsible for helping to establish a national, a NIBIN National Correlation and Training Center. And a group of well-trained and supervised technicians have performed at a level in which 96 plus percent of the leads that they have been sent for confirmation actually came back as confirmed. Now, not every lead was sent for confirmation, but of those sent for co confirmation, over 90 percent, 96 percent came back confirmed. That's a very good rate. Next. It's been impo considered important to have DNA swabbing or fingerprint of evidence prior to handling it for test firing or ballistic imaging. However, the majority of firearm related evidence is not even linked to another case and it can hinder timeliness, especially if lab based. So a better solution, find a non-laboratory solution to it because a lab, lab solution will slow it down. Do a cost-benefit assessment and minimize in routine cases. Two agencies have incorporated DNA swabbing and fingerprint processing on all firearms, and guess what? They're still able to get the guns test fired within a single day because of the processes that they've incorporated. Next. Next. Uh, it should be showing the essential, important, desirable with important all leads need to be confirmed prior to release. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. No I skipped ahead. That's my fault. All leads need to be confirmed prior to release. However, not all leads are viable, and reports by forensic science laboratories issuing non-confirmed leads indicate that confirmations are rarely requested. Better solution is to issue non-confirmed leads. A confirmed lead weeks after an incident is less valuable to an investigator than an unconfirmed lead within days of the incident. That's the biggest key. 
is it can do a lot more with an unconfirmed lead within a few days of the incident than a confirmed lead weeks later. We can develop good quality control processes to ensure that non-confirmed leads are of high quality. Next. We also have to understand our data. An example of this occurred when I was working for ATF. During the budget cuts that NIVIN was experiencing, many laboratories got offended when ATF was cutting funding for the maintenance agreements for supporting IBIS equipment. Some fought past that and remained within NIVIN while others sought alternative solutions. Others opted out justifying alternative technologies based on comparisons with heritage equipment or that in the case of a regional laboratory, well, only 3% of our hits are outside this region, so we're just going to con be concerned with our region. I suggested that considering they were not close to being comprehensive in data collection, this was likely not reflective of the situation considering some of the cities outside the region. And as it turned out, ATF was doing an initiative with one of the cities in that region, and NIVIN was a part of that initiative. So let's look at the results of a four-month time frame for that initiative. Next. Of 472 entries made, a total of 87 leads were developed, 46 of which involved an agency outside this area serviced at regional lab in question. That is almost 53% as compared to the 3% that was being suggested. There was clearly a personal or a professional agenda that was not looking at it from a public service standpoint. And it's important to be able to set aside those personal or professional agendas and pursue what's in the common interest. Next. We also have to move beyond tradition. Remember that stack of boxes? Well, there's another box, the small one to the left. Firearm examiners seem to have a box too, and it's even smaller. And if it could have more than one lid, it would. It'd probably have 20 on it. And I can say this because I was one of those that protected that box for a long, long time. Next. As a lot, firearm exam, oh, yep. You went too far ahead, Aaron. One back. Nope, okay, then there's a slide missing. So keep it there. As a lot, firearm examiners are protective and resistant to change. This is a challenge because ballistic imaging technology is a screening tool that does not require the same level of expertise as a comprehensive examination. So we have to move beyond the firearm examiners. We also have to be flexible. The common goal of public entrustment has to be placed above personal or agency agendas. For example, a laboratory who insists that firearm examiners be involved in all aspects of ballistic imaging technology is needlessly limiting the potential of that technology when it has been demonstrated it's not necessary. Prosecutor's office who insists on near pointless fingerprint examinations or DNA processing because quote unquote the juries have come to expect it. Well, it's time to argue why it wasn't necessary and stop trying to take the easy way out. Next. Next. We can move, yeah, there we go. For flexibility, the key for all collaborators, define what is essential. Be willing to consider other ideas outside your normal comfort zone. Not everything's gonna work as well as initially planned. I know that. Uh, the best laid plans have gone to pot sometimes. So be prepared to make changes until the processes get synchronized well. And new things may develop that had not been anticipated, so adjustments may be necessary. Next. When attempting something new and innovative that requires flexibility and will likely require adjustments as processes are ironed out, it's best to start small and build wisely. An example is on the next page, so next. The key principles, if regional, then select a city with which to begin. So if you're a county lab or a state lab, the state of Connecticut began with New Haven to establish a successful base from which they could learn and build to expand to other areas of the state. If accredited, define it as a short-term pilot. Bottom line is accreditation is not about stopping you from doing things differently. It's about verifying that processes are appropriate for use and that we are following the processes we have written for ourselves 
there are a lot of accredited laboratories that have gone in the direction that we're, uh, we're discussing here, and they've been very successful. We have to keep in mind that we shouldn't be concerned with the backlog. It's already too late, and it puts current cases at risk. It will kill momentum. Therefore, prove you can remain current before even attempting to work on a backlog. Initially, meetings should be relatively frequent. As processes ironed out, they can become less frequent. And the fifth bullet point is the hardest to swallow. Initially, we will have to sacrifice reallocating what we already have to demonstrate that it can be done with limited resources on a small scale. Bottom line is, why should people buy into what we say the potential is? Let's prove it on a small pilot scale, demonstrate that it can be successful. At least we have a foundation from which we can uh, request further funding. I mean, the parable of the good servant is based on the fact that he had to demonstrate faithfulness with the little he was given before he would be given more. Next. So how do we enlarge the box? Here's some examples. Accredited federal laboratory with a backlog in excess of 1,000. They modified policies and procedures within accreditation guidelines and eliminated that backlog while remaining current with current cases in only three months. Next. An accredited state laboratory adjusted policies and processes for a three-month pilot with a local city looking at a maximum 72-hour turnaround time for firearm-related evidence, and they reallocated one technician to do this. This resulted in a suspect apprehended in a car stop not being released because the firearm in his possession was linked to a homicide without a suspect within a required maximum maximum holding period before that case would have just gone into the backlog. This laboratory found such success that they made adjustments more permanent and offered, it, offered services to other cities in the state with additional funding. Next. One of my favorites. City of 655,000 in 2015. They installed the brass tracks in the evidence room and arranged for correlation reviews with technicians at ATF. In their first year, 75% of all firearm-related evidence was entered within 72 hours, 95% within a week. 3,000 total entries, 290 leads, and 112 individuals identified and or arrested as a result of those leads. Guess what? Not one firearm examiner was in that process. That was all technician based. Next. So as long as laboratories remain in a fixed box, unwilling to expand it to meet the circumstances and the conditions of what is happening on the streets, those in the streets will find an increasing need to seek and find justice for themselves. When law enforcement is unresponsive to victims, they are almost boxed in, forced to look to themselves just to protect them and their family, which only escalates the issue. Next. As we expand the box, at the very least, we will be able to encompass more of the streets. Even better is when it's noticed on the streets and that box in turn begins to shrink as they begin to trust more and more in justice being served than rather to having to serve it themselves. Next. So what is informational forensics? I just want to reiterate what Aaron opened with. It's a commitment on the part of forensic science laboratories to collaborate with clients and stakeholders to identify needed change and creating a vision to guide that change so that our communities can become safer places for all to have an opportunity to reach their potential. Next. With respect to crime gun intelligence and shooting crime, it begins in the streets, treating each shooting crime as a potential key to getting an active shooter off the streets. The potential is there with ballistic imaging technology. Maximizing that potential requires a shift in our typical thinking and application in forensic science laboratories. Next. And with that, that's my contact information. I'm going to hand this back off to Aaron and Rick. You bet, Rick. Rick, are you there? Rick, are you there?
Oh, I'm here. I thought you were going to introduce me. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. My name is Rick Wyant. I supervise the firearms section in Seattle. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of Ron's points in the practical application and the Seattle model that it's been known has been known as now, but it's basically just the Denver model that we modified a little bit to adapt for our needs up here. But back when we started with IBIS, we had one technician for the whole state of Washington back in 1999. And we really were just putting in casework as it came in and not really going out and soliciting IBIS entries. And then in 2007, we got a system in Seattle, even though we didn't have a technician, and we had the idea of bringing in Seattle PD and training some of their evidence staff to enter not only their evidence directly from their property room, which is down the road, but also help us with some of our entries as well. And we had some limited success. We've achieved a few hits, but the problem is, is as Ron mentioned, those hits go to a backlog and someday we'll get to them. And we were only addressing them if a prosecutor were to call on a potential link or if it did link to a case we're currently working for firearms analysis. So what happened with that is customers just lost interest and we weren't getting the IBIS entries and we weren't getting the hits and the hits took so long to follow up when they finally got a hit request and it was confirmed um, they weren't doing anything with it investigative wise. So in about 2015, a member of the Denver ATF came over here to Seattle and wanted to implement what they were doing in Denver and Seattle. And we said, said that sounds great. And we hired a IBIS tech just for the Seattle Crime Lab back in 2015. Next. So we met with the ATF task force and came up with a plan. And these are the four goals that we instituted. And one of them, again, a reflection of the success in Denver was to have rapid turnaround on getting shootings that happen on the street within the system in 48 hours. And then what we also had to do was adapt our WSP lab policies to be able to efficiently put that in and turn it around and put those immediate lead notifications out on the street so detectives could use them. And what we thought about doing was have our confirmations optional. And what I mean by that is every hit per our policy that came in, uh, we had to look on the microscope, generate a microscopic comparison report before we could tell anyone, especially detectives, that these two cases were linked. Of course, that was the backlog issue, and we weren't able to turn those around really quick with our current system. So we also had the other idea, since we brought in the saddle guys in 2007, let's train some more users, and let's try to really go out and talk to the agencies and describe what IBIS can do for them. And of course, the ultimate goal is to reduce crime by turning these cases around rather quickly. Next. So what are the hangups? What are our stumbling blocks that we came into when we were trying to put this policy together? And one of them was evidence was not always being submitted. We were getting a lot of guns from property rooms, but not a lot of cartridge cases laying on the ground from scenes. And the analogy I like to use when I talk to agencies is, well, if we fingerprinted everybody in the room but never took a latent print off the window, we're not going to get any success with the system. And so that's what we've really been harping on um, since 2015, on talking to agencies and having them send in the most obscure shootings, even with no victim, no suspect, no injuries, limited property damage, and getting those entered in the system. And then we also had the problem with having a delay from the time the crime happened until the detective actually sent it in to us. And so we needed to come up with a way to streamline that as well. And, and as Ron mentioned, just like every other laboratory, we do have a backlog, we have staffing issues, trying to get things turned around, trying to keep up with our current caseload. And if we don't demonstrate success with the system, all the education in the world is not going to increase its success because people aren't going to send in evidence. And what we also, and again, Ron touched on this with the efficient feedback loop. If we're not talking to detectives and detectives aren't talking to us and prosecutors aren't talking to detectives, we're not going to be able to demonstrate efficiency and success either. So we really needed to get out there and 
educate everyone at all levels involved in this process. Next. Next slide, please. Is anyone there? Yep, I'm yep. here. I'm not sure why it's not going to the next slide. <laughs> Stand by. I thought I fell into no man's land. <laughs> well, that slide's fine. We'll just we'll just go from there. So the first thing we had to do, and if there's any forensic scientists listening, and they're accredited, they know what we're talking about here. Is you can't just decide to do something. You have to change your policy, and you have to justify the change in your policy before you can institute something new. And as Ron also mentioned, there's a lot of resistance and change, um, especially at the forensic science level of, well, we've always done it this way and it's worked. Why should we change what we do? So that took a little bit of doing, but we were able to change our policy a little bit and try to meet the memo, memo of understanding that we had with ATF on how to use IBIS more efficiently. Go ahead. So the first thing we want to do, and again, Ron mentioned this, I'm kind of doubling on some of his points, but Latent print and DNA on firearms does slow down our process, especially if it comes through the crime lab. They have backlogs as well. Uh, we only have one latent lab in the state and it's not in Seattle, so there's a transport issue. So there's some certainly delays if a gun needs fingerprinted and DNA before it's fired. So we trained a lot of our detectives, at least in our area, to swab their cartridge cases and their guns for DNA and be able to get that immediately put in the NIVIS system the Niven system. Now we're not running those swabs, we're just collecting the swabs from the cartridge cases, packaging them, making an evidence item, and then if for some reason we need to run that DNA later, we can. And that collaboration really was successful and we we're able to get that evidence in the system more rapidly. Next. So I don't know if you can read that top header, but it says entry of fired cartridge cases from all crime scenes. And that is really the key to our success that we've had in Seattle is really hammering these agencies to send in fired cartridge cases from scenes even if they don't really have a crime to tie to it. And then secondly, having those agencies go through their property room or at least new guns coming to the property room, getting them swab for DNA and doing their own test firing. Something that keeps weight off of us gets their guns in into the system and then they can destroy or give them back to the owner if needed without really coming into the crime lab. And then we instituted a policy where DNA and latents were a case by case, not always performed for a test fire. We leave that up to the agency and the prosecutor's office to determine uh, what needs to be collected. Next. And what are Ibis Tech, and I'll talk a little about her later. But what she suggested as she put the system together and tried to get our process more efficient is if we have a regular firearms case come into the lab that's going to go in the backlog, she will make an additional laboratory request, pull one of the cartridge cases out of that that's already been DNA'd, of course, and enter that in the system within a week of it coming into the door. So even though we haven't worked that homicide case or that other firearms comparison case, that case is getting put into the Niven system fairly rapidly from the time it's submitted. And we've demonstrated some success with that as well. Okay, go ahead. So another thing that she came up with is to triage cases as they come in. In Seattle, with our rash of gang shootings we've had up here, we have multiple shots fired, 15, 20, 30 shots. And before we instituted our new policy, every one of those had to be entered in the system. And, what, and she had a latent print background, so that was helpful. But we trained her to triage cartridge cases as they came in. They look, she looks for similar marks, class characteristics, if you will, and then picks one or two from that pile of cartridge cases and gets them in the system. One, it slows down correlation time, and it does preserve, say, the other 28 or so for DNA if they're not already swabbed. And it gets that in the system quicker and the quicker results. 
And of course, with that, we had to generate our own form. This is a form that she used for triaging cases, or cartridge cases, as she goes through them. And she'll do a little sketch of the head stamp and the breech face markings. And there are some, there are some training that went on to it, of course, if you're going to institute this. But uh, we found it very successful to have a technician screening cartridge cases and then selecting what gets put into the IVA system. And I've touched on this a little bit. Education and training of our user agencies is really key to what we've been able to accomplish here in Seattle. Next. We generated some trifold brochures that had what IBIS is and selection and submission criteria, what labs they go to, contact information. And we have those up at our evidence counter that anyone who brings evidence in can take several. And we've also provided them at our trainings and we mail them out as well. And what we've also done is we we trained, well, ATF trained Jennifer, our IBIS technician, to train the trainer, meaning she brings in other agencies, trains them to use the system, and then provides them guidance to go back to their agency and describe what IBIS is and how they can use it more efficiently to solve their crime. And she also did a little road show where she went around the state to all our major areas and tried to get not only the users and the detectives, but decision makers in the room and describe basically what we're describing today, how useful and successful IBIS can be when used properly. Okay, go ahead. This is one of the little flow charts that we emailed out and put in our flyer. It talks about what to do if you get a firearm for testing, because as I stated earlier, we don't test fire firearms for IBIS entry anymore in the laboratory. We put that back on the agency, but there's obviously times for which the, the firearm would come to the crime lab, and this flowchart demonstrates that. Go ahead. This is our new our hit slash lead notification form. So within minutes, if not hours, of a hit being identified in the system, um, this form will be generated. It basically has both sides of the hit. The, case information for both sides, the cartridge case that linked to the other one. And this form will be emailed immediately to both detectives or officers involved with that submission of that particular evidence. And you can see at the bottom, you might not be able to see at the bottom, but it says it's confirmation needed. And we've really tried to stress that with our agencies that not every lead needs to be confirmed, meaning put under the microscope, given a case number for comparison, and then a report peer review generated, et cetera. And we probably confirm maybe 10 or 15% of our leads. Um, sometimes that lead really doesn't go anywhere, or they're able to develop further information on that case based on the potential, potential confirmation of that case. But if they want a cell phone warrant or a regular search warrant, the prosecutor can request a confirmation and we'll of course do that through the normal routine and send that report out. Okay, next. Did we hang up again? Yeah, we did just yeah, one did. second. My pictures are just too cool. <laughs> I think that's right. <laughs> I think that's right. There we go. So another thing Jennifer did was she instituted walk-in Wednesdays, meaning detectives can hand carry his evidence into the laboratory, put it into the NIBIN system, and then leave with it. And that helps us on a couple of levels. One, it prevents increased backlog for our property and evidence custodians who don't have to log it in, get to the case number, get to the barcode, check it into evidence for our NIBIN our NIBIN technician to check it out, bring it to the back, put it in the system, and then return it. Um, this helps the agency because they get rapid entry, rapid turnaround, and it also helps our agency because that's one less piece of evidence that we have to take in. And we've had pretty good success with that, and we've had a couple of um, immediate hits that have gone to other cases in that jurisdiction and even other jurisdictions, and that turnaround is within hours, which makes everybody look good. 
Next. And I mentioned it a couple times, we've done quite a bit of outreach to our agencies. We have a couple of bullet traps that we've loaned out to rural agencies that don't really have a range for which to go fire firearms to collect cartridge cases. And that's helped facilitate their participation in the program and send things to us and be involved where they might not have been involved otherwise. Jennifer and a couple of our trainees have also contacted agencies that don't really seem to be interested in IBIS, probably for those other reasons that I mentioned earlier, and reach out to them and try to encourage them to send in some some of their test fires and evidence items for, for comparison and entry. So I'm going to go through a couple of our successes, and that's probably what you've all been waiting for. But we have we've had a couple just within the last couple of weeks that I didn't really get into the PowerPoint, but I'll talk about some of the ones that have happened over the last couple of years. But we've had uh, the, the Crime Lab Intelligence Center, which is basically the task force that Sound serves from us, and they keep track of these hits not only from the investigative level but um, from the crime lab level as well because we're, we're just upstairs. And they help develop leads and intelligence and gather warrants, whereas the agency itself, the police agency where that crime occurred, might not have had the time or the resources to address it. And then the, the detectives from Federal Way, that next bullet point, uh, those are both walk-ins where they came in. Um, during the walk-in Wednesdays or walk-in any time and entered that in and car hand carried that out and within a couple of hours knew that their their cases were linked together. Next. And this case is really what got Washington State Patrol involved and for those who don't know the Washington State Patrol Crime Laboratory is the only laboratory system in Washington. So we serve all police jurisdictions in the state of Washington. So as you would suspect, the majority of our cases that we analyze are not Washington State Patrol cases. Well, this one happened to be a Washington State Patrol case because it happened on a freeway. This car was uh, shot up and the detective investigated it. Um, was not really clear about Niven. He'd heard about it, but we encouraged him to bring in those cartridge cases, put it in Niven, and it hit on a myriad of cases. So we use this one as our, our poster child to demonstrate that you might have a, a little shooting in your jurisdiction, but it might be part of the pie for a really big picture. And this one certainly was. We had four additional shooting events linked to that one drive-by shooting. Two homicides, one out of Oregon and one out of Seattle, and then another assault out of Seattle. And the homicide out of Oregon, there was eventually a pursuit and an apprehension of, of two shooters. And that, that's still pending trial, but it's a, another another reason to get, get all the sorry, I think I kinda get all the cartridge cases from evidence scenes entered into the system. Okay, go ahead. So in 2017, just earlier this year, we had a little rash of, of gun violence and uh, some of the agencies expanded the task force. We already had one, of course, so that media story isn't entirely accurate, but uh, we got a lot more interest because of the media attention that some of these shootings were getting. Next. Well, that's a little cut off. It says multi-jurisdictional, and you can see all the little dots on there. Those are all the shootings that were put into IBIS that uh, linked to each other, and eventually uh, intelligence, enough intelligence was gathered where a search warrant was gained and two rifles were recovered, but we were able to match um, all, all those shootings to two separate rifles, including a cartridge case that was seized at the Canadian border. You can see a little red dot, little arrow up there. So this is my whiteboard, which you have to do when you get cases like this. I've uh, blotted out the case numbers, but you get an idea of the microscopic comparison that comes with these sorts of cases ended up having uh, two guns, and those are all the cases there that those guns link to uh, via Niven. And I think six different jurisdictions. So this is the 
the note from the prosecutor related to these cases. And we investigated eight different shootings, two different firearms, and you can see the victims there. And they were they were called in the media thrill killers or thrill shooters, but they were spraying and praying and um, hitting unintended targets. But one was a family with young children, a teacher's home, and a couple others. And luckily, no one was killed in those shootings, but there was evidence that was gathered from the search warrant on that that linked to a previous homicide. But so outreach and education, Jennifer's done a couple of uh, media frenzies where they've come into the laboratory. Again, this, this silence from crime and the, the gang-related situations here have really led to them wanting to come talk to us, which is great because that gives us the opportunity to spread more media, spread to the media all of our successes that we've had with the system and demonstrate how participation will really help reduce crime in, in our area. Go ahead. And this slide speaks for itself. Little hits of, of more than doubled over the past two years. Now, it is a double-edged sword, of course, and anyone in the crime lab is probably looking at this, understanding what I'm about to say, but when you start getting hits and success, that adds pressure to your firearms examiners and to your technicians. So there's something you have to be prepared for. When you start giving the education, going out and demonstrating how the system works and how successful it can be, you're going to get bogged down with, with a lot of hits. And you have to be prepared to manage those and, again, go to your administrators and try to get funding. And as Ron mentioned, you have to have success before you can get funding, and we're kind of in that boat right now. We're to a point where we've been begging managers for for more firearms examiners to to help identify some of these uh, some of these hits and put out reports. Go ahead. So this is one of many statistics that we've we've gathered over the years, but our gun crime in the area of the Seattle area is down 16% since 2015, and that is largely due to the task force and their warrants and their identification of these these shooters. And like Ron mentioned earlier, you know, majority of these shootings are done by a small percentage of people. And once you start linking them all together, it can really be helpful. But so wrap up. Here's here's the big the four big points. Convince agencies to send in their evidence. And you know, it sounds easy, but at the end of the day, it's really not that easy to get them to add another log to their fire in, in terms of things they need to do. And we've tried to make that easier for them. We've made our range available that they can come and fire their firearms into and immediately put their test fires into the system. We'll have, we'll have technicians, um, Jennifer or other trained examiners that can put things in our system ready for them. We have our walk-in Wednesdays that allows them to just bring in evidence, you know, hot off the press, so to speak, put it in the system and then take it back and book it into evidence. And we streamlab our lab, lab processes to make it more efficient. We have stickers for our requests, and what I mean by that is we have our laboratory requests, and we can put something into IBIS, simply put a sticker on the re lab request that says this has been put in IBIS, and it goes away. There's no crime lab report generated because there's no real analysis done. We're simply taking a picture of that evidence item and giving it back to them, and that has certainly sped up the process of IBIS entry. And our, our big thing, of course, is training our decision makers, going out to these agencies. And what we found is there's a lot of detective turnover, more than we thought. So we'll go to one agency, and three months later, we'll have two or three different people in that unit that may or may not know about IBIS or know what we can do for them. So it's a constant circle of us um, keeping everyone up to speed on what we can do from the laboratory standpoint. And of course, the key to success is a motivated and driven NIVIN staff. And this is certainly 100% Jennifer, our IBIS tech that we hired in 2015, who has made this program a success. She's a total go-getter. And if you put someone in there, it's just uh, working a retirement job or not really invested in the system, you're not going to see the success that we've seen here. You have to get someone who uh, really wants to catch bad guys and really likes to go out and talk to people. And that's what we have with her. And that's why we're all here today. Next. 
that's me and that's Jennifer. If you really need to know what's going on behind the scenes, uh, Jennifer is the one to email. I'm just the boss. But those are both for our contact information. And I guess uh, perhaps we have some time for some questions. Yes, thank you, Rick. Thank, thank you, Ron. We do have we do quite a few questions. Quite a few questions. I think most of them are for you, Rick, but uh, Ron, certainly feel free to weigh in after Rick has responded. The first question is, is uh, Rick, do you enter all calibers? And if yes, how many firearms and crime scene fired, fired cartridge cases are you entering per month? That is a great question. In fact, I prepared for that question. Oh, assuming my email will come up. Hang on. So to give you an example of August 2017, we have uh, two laboratories that have IBIS systems. We have the Tacoma system and the Seattle system. So for the month of August, Tacoma entered 90 and Seattle entered 344. And the reason there's a difference there is because, we, again, we have outside agencies also entering things into our system. And also um, our farms examiners are entering in addition to what Jennifer is doing. In that month, we had Tacoma had 13 identified hits, and in Seattle we had 48 identified hits. And I'm not sure what percentage of that. Most of that is going to be, well, I would say 50/50 at this point because we've really gotten the word out there on evidence cartridge cases. So. I think we're about 50% firearms and 50% evidence cartridge cases on average on what we're entering per month. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I hope that answers your question. I'll let you know if they end up responding otherwise. Uh, Rick, you mentioned that detectives swabbing cartridge case, uh, you mentioned detectives swabbing detectives cartridge swabbing cases cartridge for, DNA. for DNA. Our unit is Our always unit asked why we spend the time processing for DNA and latency on casings when it's so rare to get anything. Could you make some suggestions uh, to explain and help detectives understand why this should happen on every cartridge case? Well, and I certainly understand that. We've tried to discourage the DNA on everything. Again, getting DNA off a of fired cartridge case is extremely rare, and it's equivalent, we're not really synonymous to latent prints on firearms. You're, you're going to do it because the jury expects it, is what the prosecutors say, but we're, we are pushing some of our prosecutors and detectives um, the other way a little bit, and we're getting some success on, well, maybe we don't necessarily need to get DNA swabbed on that. Um, the percentage of cartridge cases we're running and actually putting in and getting trying to get a profile on is very low, but we are swabbing all of them, and I hope that makes sense to everybody, but um, we swab them all, we put them in a little foil pack, they go in with the cartridge case, and then they sit there majority of the time without being processed. One, because our DNA backlog is huge and they have other cases to do. And a lot of times suspects can be identified either through cell phone tower warrants or surveillance video based on the IBIS hit. And I think I had a slide in there that got skipped, but a lot of the success that we've had on these no suspect, no victim cases that we've entered in IBIS and they've hit is the task force or detectives can go back and look at surveillance video, uh, traffic cam video, and identify common vehicles that are used in some of these drive-by shootings and assaults and homicides. And so it's, it's worth noting that even though that DNA is, is swabbed, there's Getting it in an IBIS is really going to be what's going to generate um, immediate results or can generate immediate results on some of these drive-by shootings. Because even if you do get a DNA profile, that doesn't necessarily mean that was the shooter. And that could have been someone who just handled it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But um, to answer the question, I'm kind of getting long-winded on this, but to answer the question is yes, we are still majority of the time um, swabbing the cartridge cases, but not, not processing yeah. them. If I may, if I may um, um, there has been there has some been studies out of Southern California that have discussed uh, a different technique to get DNA off of cartridge cases. And what has ended up happening is they've been successful because DNA technology can now identify or, or at least provide profiles for very small trace amounts of DNA. 
the issue, of course, is relevance because, as Rick said, it doesn't necessarily mean that the uh, that's the shooter's DNA. As an example, there was a case out of Northern California where an individual was a suspect uh, in a homicide, major homicide. And as it turned out, at the time of the homicide, the suspect was sleeping off a drunk in a hospital uh, because he had been picked up by EMTs and taken to a hospital because he had passed out. And so what ended up happening is that same EMT responded to the homicide scene and he transferred the DNA from the guy that he just dealt delivered to the hospital to the crime scene. So yes, we can we can do various things with DNA and with the DNA technology, you know, we can we can get results off of smaller and smaller samples. The question is, what does it eventually mean? And I'm always a proponent just because we can do something doesn't mean we necessarily should. So we should be looking at these issues as well. And I really like what Rick said. There are alternative ways, the cell phone records and uh, the, the uh, video cameras and what have you, that detectives can use that can be uh, as effective. Muted. Great. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Ron. Muted. Um, Rick, and uh, can you talk a little bit about your current NIBIN and comparison case backlog and then um, talk a little bit about historically what the highest that backlog has ever been? Muted. Sure. When Jennifer started, our backlog was about 1,000 cases. Our case backlog for NIBIN now is five. I checked it this morning. So she is on top of getting our backlog out. Um, our firearms comparison backlog is at about 200, and we have an, an analyst, our examiner, in training. So we'll be in good shape after next year. But we're doing rushes, rush case to rush case currently, and also identifying or confirming some of these rush and Ivan hits that we received. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question I think is for both you, Rick, as well as you, Ron. Do you think there are ethical implications of detectives using non-confirmed leads for investigations? Muted. There could be. Um, the issue is, you know, they can, they can use a lot of different things in their interview processes. I had a uh, individual who signed my name to a official laboratory report form and claimed that I did work that I didn't even do. Uh, so they can do a lot of things in the interview process. The issue is whether or not the unconfirmed leads are actually reliable. And if you set up a quality system uh, so that the unconfirmed leads, and, and uh, keep in mind, a quality system also includes verbatim on the notifications disclaimers, if you will, that this is not a uh, confirmed lead, that it needs to be confirmed using microscopic comparisons. It's for investigative purposes only. I mean, investigators operate by different rules than crime labs do, and we can't legislate that. And so it's important to give them the information that they need to have, and provided you set enough um, uh, guidelines in place with disclaimers on the report forms and your quality system is good enough so that what you're sending them is not a oh this may be a lead 25 percent no I mean it should be a high quality lead going out as I talked about the center the, the leads that were sent out for confirmation that were actually sent out for confirmation over 96 percent were confirmed so provided you have a good system in place provided you have disclaimers on the notifications it shouldn't be an issue. Great, thank you. Muted. Rick, do you want to comment I'll, on that? you want to comment on that? Sure, I'll echo. Muted. But we do have a fair amount of confidence in the system, and I don't work for FBI, so I can say this. We used to call IBIS the blind squirrel because sometimes it finds a nut. But with the advent of the 3D technology and the advances of the algorithm, uh, it's, it's doing pretty well. And we were more apt to get a false negative than a false positive, meaning the IBIS system would miss a hit versus tell us something hits that it doesn't. And the the interface that NIBIN has now for us to be able to do digital comparisons, and we usually have two sets of eyes on it. Uh, the technician identifies it. She'll have a firearms examiner come look at it. So before we hit it, quote unquote, and send that lead, lead notification form out, 
it's looked at by two sets of eyes. We look at it from different lights and a lot of the same techniques we would do under the microscope. So we're pretty confident when it goes out there. But also having said that, our lead notification form does specifically state this is not a microscopic comparison match. This is for investigative purposes only. If you would like it confirmed, please notify us, et cetera, et cetera. So we've gone both ways. We've had, uh, I guess, investigative knowledge developed based on the lead notification that has resulted in an arrest, and then the hit comes afterward, or the hit confirmation comes afterward. And then the opposite has occurred, where they want the hit confirmation previous to getting a warrant or getting a cell phone tower dump, et cetera. Great. Thank you both. Uh, just a couple more questions, Rick. We've talked a little bit about confirmation. Can you, um, do you have an estimate on the number of confirmations that you've done in 2017 so far? Needed. Um, yes, I can pull up our, my little email right here. Year to date. In Seattle, we've confirmed 18 this year. And I think we're at about 200 hits for the year. Uh, nope, scratch that. We're at 401 hits for the year for Seattle, and we've confirmed 18 of them. So less, <laughs> quite a bit. Go, but but for the most part, uh, we're we're confirming a small percentage of of the hits. Great, thank you. And then last question uh, is, how do you work with the investigation side of the house? Do you have meetings with them or do you primarily update them through email? How, can you talk through that process a little bit? Needed. Sure. Well, we're fortunate in Seattle is the task force is downstairs from us. And I'm quote unquote the Nibin liaison through for the task force. So I do have regular meetings with them. But again, Jennifer is the spearhead for that. Um, she's got a, we have members of the task force that come up and use the system. They come up and test fire firearms that they get off of warrants, put them in the system. So we have almost a daily interaction with them. And then they both go, Jennifer and someone from the task force, usually Sam Gonzalez or someone else, will go out and do the training together. So when they go address an agency, say Bellevue PD, they will get a presentation from the lab side of the house and also the task force side of the house and how we've collaborated to make the, make the system successful. And they get face time with both, with the member from both sides. And I think that is really what has helped us get popularity. Great, thanks, thanks again, Rick. Um, one more question uh, that, that just came in that was pretty intriguing. Um, do bullet fragments, and Ron, Rick, I'm not sure, maybe both of you, um, do bullet fragments have any evidentiary value for testing? Needed. Go ahead, Ron. <laughs> for <laughs> for testing, for they testing do for comparison. Uh, but unless they have a bullet tracks, they cannot be entered in an Ivan. Brass tracks only handles cartridge cases. But we've gotten plenty of uh, comparisons, and I've done plenty of identifications with bullet fragments and damaged bullets. Great. Well, thank you both very much. Um, thank you to our audience for taking the time. I know that we went over by a few minutes here. Um, I apologize for not getting to all of the questions. Uh, but again, I want to thank um, Ultra Electronics Forensic Technology. I want to thank Ron and Rick for uh, both sponsoring and presenting at this webinar. And with that, this concludes today's Justice Clearinghouse webinar. Thank you all very much. Have a great day and stay safe. Bye now. Thank you.